Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Mark Gibson, Associate Dean Media Writing Publishing at um, RMIT. And it's my great pleasure to welcome everyone here to celebrate the appointment of Patricia Carvelis as Honorary Professor in Journalism. Like many here, I have breakfast almost every day listening to PK <laughs> and have long been an, an admirer of her journalism, so it's really wonderful to have her here this evening. I'd like to acknowledge the many distinguished guests and students in the audience, both here in the Capitol Theatre and online. In particular, Professor Tim Marshall, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, College of Design and Social Context, and Professor Lisa French, Dean of the School of Media and Communication, and also the journalism team, including program, a Deputy Program Manager, Dr. Hakeem Chung, who have organised tonight's event. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we are on here tonight, the people of the Woiwurrung and Bunurrung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nations. We pay respect to their elders, laws, customs and creation spirits. We recognise the, that these lands have been a meeting place for many thousands of years, one where people have come together to talk, share knowledge and learn from each other. Tonight we are continuing a long tradition of coming together from many different places to build our understanding of each other and to learn from each other. I take this opportunity to remember that sovereignty was never ceded. This always was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'll now ask Journalism Programs Manager Associate Professor Alex Wake to introduce PK. Woman Jenka, everyone, how fantastic is it for us to be beginning a new academic year back in the Capitol Theatre and back with one of our program's favourite people, um, now Professor um, Patricia Carvelis. I am delighted that I have the huge honour and privilege today of introducing our honorary professor. But before I do so, I would like to share a little bit of RMIT journalism history. 20 23 marks 50 years of journalism education at RMIT. Back in 1972, when we started the Diploma of Journalism, things were a little different. The Aboriginal Tent Embassy was constructed in front of Parliament House, or now Old Parliament House. The Premier of Victoria was Henry Bolte. Six pupils and their teacher were kidnapped for $1 million ransom in Victoria in what was known as the Faraday School Kidnapping. The health warning, smoking is a health hazard, became compulsory on cigarettes and a packet of Craven A Special Mild cost, mild cost less than a cup of coffee. Adam Bant and Dan Andrews were both born and the US President Richard Nixon visited China. All of these events would have been covered in what we now know as our weekly news quiz. And heaven help the young student journo who couldn't spell Balti or didn't know the cost of a litre of milk, and that's real milk, not oat or almond or soy. We've also seen some major changes to our media industry and education program in Victoria, Australia and the rest of the world. While our diploma might have started as a vocational four-year part-time course specifically for cadet journalists, it was among the first to recognise the philosophical and scholarly underpinning of journalism, and by 1978 it had evolved into a full bachelor degree, which continues to this day and now sits alongside a graduate diploma of journalism. Over the decades, RMIT has continued to blaze the way for journalism pedagogy and scholarship in Victoria in the education of critically reflective journalism practitioners like PK. At the same time, our papers and radio stations, magazines and TV networks have also changed with different names, different bosses, different audiences and different ways of accessing and interacting with the news. But significantly, we're finally seeing that the once predominantly male white press pack is now starting to look like the rest of the country. And that's something we at RMIT are very proud to support. If journalists and journalism are going to be trusted, we must look and represent the full spectrum of whom we write, um, write for and about. Today, our staff are particularly focused on encouraging greater diversity among our students, staff and researchers. 
And in the coming weeks and months of this 50th year, you will hear much more about how we are supporting diversity and the future of journalism. But today, we are particularly pleased to announce the appointment of someone who has really championed diversity through her profession and her practice. Professor Carvelis's career since graduating from RMIT has spanned print, radio and television. She is one of the country's most respected journalists for her outstanding coverage of local, national daily affairs and major issues. She's been a senior political correspondent and been commended in the Walkleys, has won the inaugural Wallace Brown Young Achiever Award for the Press Gallery, Press Gallery Journalism for her reporting of the Howard government's intervention in the Northern Territory Aboriginal communities in 2007. In supporting her for this nomination, leading Australian First Nations scholar, Professor Marcia Langton praised PK for her body of work, noting that she had taken, quote, a specific and forensic interest in covering First Nations issues with an unwavering commitment to accuracy and the high standard of reportage, end quote. Professor Carvelis is now the presenter of the Radio National Breakfast Program and the podcast The Party Room. Prior to that, she hosted Radio National Drive as well as afternoon briefing on ABC News TV. She has continued her focus on First Nations issues with a dedication to interviewing the key people from the Indigenous sector and government, informing the nation in an unbiased way while presenting Indigenous matters in a well-informed, analytical manner. On the issue of Indigenous recognition in the Constitution, Professor Carvelis has played a key role in explaining the significance and importance of this change through the various stages of a very long debate. As Professor Langton says, even as a senior journalist covering the major issues of the day, interviewing government ministers and business leaders, Carvelis remains committed to giving a platform to those most marginalised in our communities and takes a deeper interest in policy to bring unbiased coverage to her audiences. She does so with consummate professionalism and rigour. Professor Carvelis has already spent more than five years very quietly supporting our students at RMIT. She brings her wealth of experience and understanding of journalism to this role and enriches the teaching and research environment in the School of Media and Communication. We're absolutely delighted to invite PK to the stage for her professorial lecture and remind the audience that we'll have a short time for questions at the end of her speech. Professor Carvelis. I'm a little shorter than Alex. Um, thank you very much for those kind words, Alex. And I too want to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we meet tonight and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. In my inaugural lecture here at RMIT, where I began journalism studies in 1996, <clears throat> I want to give you some insights into the key issues that I've learnt working as a journalist and presenter in radio, TV, newspapers and politics. Being here with you this evening is a special privilege. I also want to acknowledge those who taught me at this university, my fellow students during those heady days and the students I have mentored here since. So when I started working as a journalist 23 years ago, the acknowledgement of country was rarely heard. Now it's commonplace. That's how significant the shifts in the way we think about Australia and its difficult past have been. In that time, there have been big changes in the media too. But the shifts in journalism, I believe, have been slower. Yet even if sometimes grindingly, grindingly slow, they have been just as profound in the promise of the kind of country that we can be, that they offer. In preparing for this lecture, I wanted to look back at the information I was receiving at the time I was a student in the late 1990s. What were the rules we were being taught about what defined and constituted news and current affairs and how much critical thinking was encouraged about challenging those established rules? I really want to make and labour this point if I can. Journalism is not a science. While there are some established elements that must never be contested, 
especially that journalism must only ever be based on facts and involve testimonials of those who are directly impacted by events, which reporters should document without fear or favour, whatever those facts might be, the stories that are chosen by reporters and news organisations to be told and the reasons for choosing those stories are certainly not fixed. There are literally thousands of Australian stories that could be told every single day. The fundamental question I want to interrogate tonight, and I think it's a big question for our society to start interrogating, is how are they being chosen and what are the barriers to them being told? So what was the literature and the information I was receiving when I was here as a student at RMIT? Our journalism Bible, and it really was back then, was a book called Reporting in Australia by Sally A. White, who was an academic right here at RMIT. I still have that book on my bookshelf. My partner, who's in the audience, occasionally says, could we clean out some of these books? And then I give her the death stare. Don't mess with Sally's book. What struck me about her book is just how similar some of the modern dilemmas in journalism are to the debates that we are still having today. While there were some enduring elements that make news, right, news inevitably must match our contemporary ideas of what matters in our culture. American journalist Tom Wicker interrogated the idea of what makes a topic gain news currency, as highlighted in Sally's book. Even as far back as 1979, which feels very long time ago now, he wrote about how the women's movement had to institutionalise itself, it had to burn bras and put forward really challenging spokespeople before the daily and the broadcast news even paid any attention. Just think about that. A movement that has been so fundamental to the changes society has experienced the fight for women's equality, the basic tenet of equality between the sexes, was deemed to have little news currency at the time. Sally White in her book talks about the tendency for news media to concentrate their attention on the known and the powerful to the exclusion of others, arguing that it causes considerable criticism from commentators who argue this imbalance perpetuates existing power structures and also denies a voice to minorities, the poor, and the powerless. She says that it is true that strong and powerful nations like the United States or Japan get more news coverage than a tiny island like Kiribati. It's also true that people who are well known for whatever reasons, whether they have elite births or they have personal achievements, notoriety, or lots of good publicity, um, I don't know, their influences or something, um, provide more grist to the news mill than a person on the street. What struck me about reading this work again and figuring out how far we've come is that this tension was actually really well documented. It was discussed. We all knew but the pressure on the media to address those concerns was not filtering through to our newsrooms. People were complaining, but no one was actually listening to them. The media only fulfills its fundamental role in a Western liberal democracy like ours of holding the powerful to account and reporting on the injustices or wrongs in our communities if there's a high degree of trust and that it's not an elitist institution that only tells some stories or only allows some news to gain currency, but that it becomes a fundamental part of our society that can be relied upon to tell the story of our most marginalised and excluded. Without that public trust, the truth is we will fail. What we know is that trust in the mainstream media and institutions more broadly is diminishing. I believe we are at a really important turning point. The public have made it crystal clear that their trust in the media has eroded. It's not like we haven't been told. Social media has given the audience the opportunity to shift away from mainstream media and both misinformation and disinformation is increasing as a result. Without a concerted and active focus on restoring that trust, the erosion will intensify and democracy will be weaker. So the question I really want to tackle in, in all of this is who gets to tell the stories and why does that even matter? Why should we even be thinking about that? When I started in journalism in Australian newsrooms, they looked vastly different to how they look now. All of the senior roles were largely in the hands of Anglo-Saxon men with similar life experiences and challenging their authority was not 
are only frowned upon, but often impossible for journalists with less agency and less power. I know that because I was one of them. Journalism was hyper macho. One of the first lessons I received was that stories were not obtained from media releases, but by making contacts. Now, that is absolutely true. That was actually a true statement that they taught me. You are only as good as the people you get to know and the stories that they are prepared to share with you that you then share and put on the public record. But the hyper-masculine culture wasn't just about cultivating contacts, you know, get to know cops at the pub, PK. It was a culture of drinking with them. It was a very, very blokey world and very hard to navigate as a young woman. It's no wonder our industry has had its own Me Too movement and moments. Because we've started from such a low base, I have often reflected positively on the changes to the makeup in our newsrooms, even if modest, and the opportunities that it provides for audiences to potentially read and see and hear a wider range of stories. The latest report from the non-profit Media Diversity Australia produced in partnership with the University of Sydney and the University of Technology, Who Gets to Tell Australian Stories 2.0, is what is known as like the second report card. They surveyed the diversity of the Australian media. It's found that while one in four people living in Australia today are from non-European cultural backgrounds, they represent just 6.1% of journalists and presenters talking about current affairs on Australian television, and no more than 1.3% if you just look at the commercial networks. I think SBS and the ABC have done a lot more of the heavy lifting here. Researchers said they were unable to identify one Indigenous journalist who appeared on the Seven Network during the survey timeframe. The report also found a general lack of diversity in leadership positions across media organisations. SBS was the only network board to have representation of Indigenous, Anglo-Celtic, European and non-European members. While corporate Australia has been on notice for some time now to really radically shift the way it hires and promotes to ensure diversity, I think the media has been slower. It's my thesis that that slowness has had a material impact on reporting and debates that are curated by the mainstream media. And now that there has been a reluctant, it's been reluctant from some parts of the media, acceptance that newsrooms should change, the reductive and predictable backlash has escalated. The backlash is really predictable. You don't even have to hear anything before you know what's going to be said. The media is becoming obsessed with identity politics, that merit should be the only criteria for recruitment and promotion. Merit, of course, is fundamental, but what I consistently witness is merit being defined through a very narrow lens. When I sat here a year ago on this stage, on probably that chair, with Barry Cassidy, uh, my colleague, uh, and I said I believed media diversity, including at my own organisation, the ABC, was a huge issue to tackle. It was reported as if it was really controversial. I'd said something wild. I think that speaks volumes about our culture. It's time for newsroom leaders to stand up and acknowledge the stories that have been missed because of a lack of diversity. We don't only call for diversity because it's a moral imperative to reflect our country better although that is part of it. We want it because we want to bring in new stories and new perspectives. We want to tell the contemporary stories of modern Australia. When I was a young reporter, one of my first ever jobs at News Limited, now known as News Corporation, I've literally worked for everyone, uh, was staffing the radio room. Now, the radio room is not like the studio I now broadcast from. Very different concept here. A radio room, which I imagine most people may never he have heard of. Put your hand up if you don't know what I'm talking about. Yep, great. No, let me explain. Um, it's a room full of police scanners and they play out signals really loudly, lots of them, all at the same time, multiple scanners from all over New South Wales. I was working in Sydney at the time. The most junior copy kid in the newsroom, and that was me, was charged with carefully listening to pick up news tips so that the reporters could be dispatched and be first on the scene on big news events. It was an important job. But while we were instructed to listen out for obvious news stories, right, like huge car accidents or gang activity, it's the things we weren't listening for that have since struck me as evidence for my thesis. There was a big silence in our reporting. A lot of that activity on those police scanners was what was referred to as a domestic 
It has often struck me in the years since that as a profession, we actually missed the biggest story of the time, the escalating violence in homes. The indifference of institutions to the scourge of family violence was profound. It took a campaign by women working in the domestic violence space to make this an everyday issue treated seriously by journalists. It took the advocacy of female journalists like Jess Hill to argue that it deserves front page coverage when women are murdered. And even then, the violence experienced by white women continues to receive different treatment to that of black women in our communities. That was powerfully exposed in 2022 by the ABC's first National Indigenous Affairs correspondent, Bridget Brennan, and Suzanne Dredge, who reported on the murders of Aboriginal women in Central Australian communities. They investigated racism in Australia's health system and the escalating number of Aboriginal children being removed from their families. Bridget is a Jaja Wurrung and Yorta Yorta woman from Victoria. Without her leadership, these kinds of stories would not get the attention that I think now they are finally starting to receive. Journalists like this are pushing their news organisations to think differently about stories, to prioritise issues that they know are endemic in communities that they understand. They are also ch challenging audiences to think about their broader world. News can't just gain currency when it's crude in a relatable way. It can't just be, how am I affected? What am I going to pay? It has to be more than that. As storytellers, we must be telling compelling stories and making bigger connections. We must be the town square and challenge any retreat into little bubbles. When I hear people say, I'm just going to stay in my bubble, I just want to stab myself with a fork. We really need to stop living in bubbles. The town square is where we need to have these debates. We need to talk and learn from each other. Social unrest thrives where we lose the ability to understand each other. It's dangerous. What has been caricatured as journalists being activists is increasingly being viewed as it should be. Journalists utilising their lived experiences and pushing their media organisations and institutions to tell stories that they know have been ignored. If you've had any experience actually living in poverty or relying on welfare to actually survive, the prism in which you approach stories often fundamentally changes. The best example of this is the work of Rick Morton, who I worked with at the Australian newspaper. Kudos to Rick, who has leaned into his own lived experience of poverty to tell stories about how the system itself can break our most vulnerable people. His daily coverage of the robo-debt inquiry has revealed shocking, shocking stories of the victims of an algorithm used by the department and political official negligence and deceit that has rocked public confidence in our political system. Never again, people are saying, and there can be no doubt that the accountability of the public service officials to comply with the law will take centre stage in a reform agenda as a result. That is what happens when our profession elevates the voices of the most disenfranchised and invests. Now, I spoke to, I, I research everything I do. This isn't just my own anecdotes. I think talking to people is really important. And I spoke to a range of largely younger journalists, which is probably makes sense that you've made this appointment. I'm really interested in what young people think. Uh, women and those who come from diverse cultural backgrounds about the way they've experienced newsrooms and the concept of neutrality being perpetuated in story selection. Not treatment, but selection. Many spoke to me about these issues and what needs to change. Some agreed to speak to me on the principle of sharing their reflections on background. Anyone who doesn't know that terminology, they don't want their names used, they worry about repercussions. Um, others have spoken to me uh, using their names on the public record. Now, Amy Ramikas is a political reporter for The Guardian. I'm sure she's well known to many of you. She told me, uh, because of so much of what the media covers has been traditionally covered through the experience of white men, it has naturally been dominated by issues that they believe worth covering. So, over the decades, we've seen the same stories covered from the same perspectives with the same voices. Amy points out that the only difference is the names have changed. She makes the powerful point that they have been telling stories through their own lived experiences. 
which then become the norm. That's the standard then. These are the stories that we're interested in. You know, we're not interested in domestic violence stories. We're interested in these stories. So the concept of neutrality has been established from those experiences and that baseline. Amy argues that no journalist is neutral in their experiences. And that's the key thing. I want to be crystal clear here because this is the bit that gets misunderstood and I'm on a warpath on it. You can be unbiased in your work and in your navigation and your coverage and at the same time acknowledge that your navigation of life means you see things through a certain lens. The part where the lived experience matters is about the way a story is told, the voices that are included, the selection of the angle. My Indigenous colleagues are bringing voices to the table that we weren't bringing to the table before. Our lived experiences do have an impact on the voices we give elevation to. So when we hear and see stories outside of that traditional white male experience, they do tend to stand out and they tend to really annoy people. This is a powerful point. When women started telling the stories of sexual harassment and abuse, some described this as activist. These activist women journalists they were telling all these activist stories about sexual harassment. Exposing abuses of power is actually a fundamental role of journalists. It's not activist. It's actually what we're meant to do. It's actually our job description. The question I want to tackle tonight is how we balance the essential and key concepts of facts and accuracy at the same time as changing the stories we tell and who's allowed to tell them. So I'm going to be up front because this is very, very contentious space. I am very troubled by the, by the idea of cancelling or silencing voices. It is my view that sunlight is the best disinfectant and I am instinctively troubled by the idea that deplatforming will do anything to address deeper issues. The job of journalists is to robustly challenge, to be armed with facts and interrogate those um, with views that might be out of step with mainstream thinking. But at the same time, that's not job done. We must be actively platforming a wider range of people and their stories. That doesn't mean that women in politics, Indigenous representatives or any politician from a minority group is exempt from media scrutiny. I want to kill the idea of the binary you are either an older generation journalist that believes in free speech, it's all just about the story, don't think about those woke issues, or you're a younger, more diverse journalist that just wants to deplatform everyone. This is the current binary we're living in. As a mid-generation journalist, I'm nor young, not old. I want to bridge that divide. I think it's important that we do, actually. Um, where is the nuance? Have we lost all nuance? Cancelling voices we are challenged by shouldn't be the way we proceed. We need to be actually doing our job and cross-examining these people. As long as we keep the fundamentals uh, and, and the tenets of journalism, and what are they? Accuracy, fairness, service to our listeners, our readers, our viewers. Journalism is only made better by a diversity of voices and experiences. Help shape our understanding of the world, and the more experiences we have of shaping that world, I think the better service we provide. There's a growing school of thought among younger reporters that journalism needs to move beyond its old prism to advance a diversity of storytelling methods as well. Amy actually made the point that not reporting on domestic violence was an accepted norm for a very, very long time. I remember thinking, oh, these stories are really important. Should I raise it? Not feeling like I could. It was presented as a fact that it wasn't newsworthy as it wasn't something it was considered to be personal. That boundary between the personal and the public interest has shifted. Our ideas, that's why it's not a science. We've changed our minds about that. As a society, we've decided that that was the wrong rule and we have a new rule now and I'm relieved about it. But there is big pushback to approaching journalism differently. My view is that we are dealing with a demographic and generational divide in journalism um, and we can't just keep living in our camps. With change means we've seen a greater feminisation of our industry too. And with that comes the abuse that every journalist, particularly women, experiences. I've been disturbed by the increasing trend towards making journalists the target if powerful interests don't like the story that you're telling. This kind of public trolling will have a chilling effect on truth-telling. 
we must ensure we make being a journalist and telling stories that break cultural taboos of what should be told doesn't lead to the attacks on individuals. Because you know what will happen? We'll go through all this process of trying to get younger, diverse people employed, and then they'll quit because they've already been quitting. That's what they do. Retention is one of our biggest issues. We make it a hostile workplace for some people. So what are the stories that weren't being told before? What needs to change? I like to come up with solutions, not just lamenting the situation we're in. We don't need to hear about Indigenous Australia always and only through the prism of white Australia. So much of our country has been explained this way already. Now, I have reflected on my own role in this. For many years, I was an Indigenous affairs reporter as a non-Aboriginal person. I have, with hindsight and the benefit of years of experience, considered the complexity of that position. I have a very nuanced view on this and believe strongly now that we must have Aboriginal Australians in the driver's seat of reporting on their own communities. This has indeed happened in my own organisation, I'm proud to say, the ABC, but also beyond. Nine newspapers have also appointed an Indigenous reporter to the role, so is The Guardian. And these are profoundly important developments. But any good news organisation, and don't miss this next point, will encourage all of their reporters to be curious and take an interest in issues beyond their lived experience. Again, not a binary. We need more reporting in areas where there is great disadvantage, such, on, such as issues of Indigenous Australia, not less. I spoke to several Indigenous elders with whom I have had enduring and long relationships, people I've known for 20 years now who met me as a baby journalist and know me, now know me as a middle-aged journalist. <laughs> and they have consistently encouraged me to stay reporting on this nationally important area. They've said the problem is that non-Aboriginal Australians have dipped in and out. The challenge is to stay connected and not only when a sensational story is before you, it has to be more than swanning in, you know, trying to win an award and then departing because the drama's gone. I think I've got a really good example of where this played out, and that's Alice Springs recently. Here was a tabloid story of epic proportions. Uh, it was, you know, it had crime, it had alcohol abuse, pictures of youth being lawless on the streets, breaking the law. It was a story that needed to be told. The media needed to be there, absolutely. But the underplaying of the stories that led to that moment, the neglect of communities, the lack of investment, the staggering levels of fetal alcohol spectrum disorders, those stories were not the focus of frenzied, frenzied coverage in the national media. You could barely find one for the weeks before about fetal alcohol syndrome. You couldn't find these stories. You just heard about dysfunction once it happened. This, of course, also played out during the reporting of the African crime wave in Melbourne. Now, journalists are good at coming in and telling those sensational stories of crime and dysfunction when the crisis is playing out. In fact, that's what we're trained to do. We're less good at doing the other work. So, did we ever ask when there was an African crime wave, and I'm using the quotation marks for those who can't see me properly, um, what are the schools like that these kids are going to? Like, what do the suburbs look like? What's the public transport like? Those are the stories we weren't actually telling in the lead up to this problem. And it was a problem. It does a disservice to communities we should be serving and doesn't tell the full story of why social issues are emerging. So we are seeing more diverse newsroom floors, but we're also hearing troubling stories from our diverse journalists. And that's my point I was making about retention. Um, a couple of people did speak on the record, a couple didn't. Melissa Macon, for instance, is an ABC journalist of Pacific Heritage. Um, I was her mentor. She explains that it's not just her, but many diverse women she works with have a deflating and regular experience of fighting for a story, pitching it relentlessly with no success, only for a white colleague to come along, pitch it, be commissioned, and become the hero of the newsroom. They congratulate themselves, win awards, it's a wonderful moment. She says there is a subtle racism at play that assumes people of colour cannot be neutral. When in fact, balancing competing ideas, she says, is very simple. She says in the era of TikTok explainers, we should be able to do away with outdated interpretations of how to do this. 
we must be able to bend the assumed rules, such as the unwritten but plainly racist rule that only white people can be neutral and leverage unique insights as non-Anglos from diverse backgrounds. Melissa told me that in her experience working in regional newsrooms, there was often greater scrutiny on what she describes as white gatekeeping. Now, this term might, if you're, you're a person who is Anglo, be new to you, but this is commonly used among our diverse journalists, white gatekeeping, feeling like they're being watched to see. Are they neutral? Ooh, they come from an Arab background. Can we trust them to do a story on terrorism? People have told me these experiences people who can't go on the record, but these are the stories that they're experiencing. She says, as a woman of colour, it sometimes becomes a disincentive to covering these stories. She believes there should be key senior journalists from communities, so she has an idea, who can be consulted about how to approach stories. She says when she's pushed for some of these stories, she's faced all sorts of resistance. I spoke to another journalist who is Asian Australian who says that what is neutral to her as a person of colour is often considered woke or progressive to a white man in the newsroom. For example, when she filed a story about Indigenous people celebrating an educational achievement, they were, you know, tears in their eyes, it was an amazing colour story she delivered. The story was run really at the bottom, you know, deprioritised. She says she's been told she doesn't cover enough hard news because she mostly pitches stories that centre people of colour. She says being neutral and being unbiased are not the same thing. Being neutral is passive. Being neutral is watching stories centering people of colour being skipped over because people retreat and think, well, we better get it done by somebody else who doesn't have that lived experience. She said facts and accuracy are obviously irreplaceable. I want to be clear here. All of these journalists, no one contests facts and accuracy. No one. What they're talking about is uh, that coming at the expense of changing the way we tell stories, language, the way we use words, uh, the context, all of that is part of it. Now, it should go without saying, but stories about minorities should, for instance, she says, always involve minorities. <laughs> Who would have thought it? Um, if you're having a conversation, for instance, on television about Indigenous people and there are no Indigenous people talking about Indigenous people, probably should twig to you that that's a little unusual. It's like all male panels talking about things that affect women. It's a bit strange. She made a powerful point that newsrooms need to make a real effort to connect with communities and listen to people without any expectation of a news story in return. That it's not a quid, you know, it's not you give me this and I give you that. It's actually about building relationships. That's part of our job as journalists. Building trust and showing up to local events uh, when these relationships are strong, it actually does pay off. People do start trusting you. So, in ending, what are the gatekeepers? Who are they? And how do we challenge the news chiefs? I love that word. The gatekeepers need to also reflect Australia and challenge the narrow definition of what makes news and what prominence we give to stories. So, our next step must challenge the norms about who gets to make decisions. It can't just be about who is on our screens. Diversity is not just about the people in front of you. It's about the decision-making process. It's about the hierarchies. So far in this debate, we've been focused on the visible. And that's been important. That's a necessary part of the debate. As the saying goes, if you can't see it, you can't be it, right? And seeing it is powerful. I rarely saw people from diverse cultural backgrounds, even coming from an ethnic community, when I was growing up. It wasn't the thing. So it did feel like you were coming into a hostile or different space. So we can't have diversity as a tick or flick exercise. There is a danger in metrics that miss the deeper story of who are the gatekeepers. What are the news values they're adhering to and what are the diversity of stories that they are telling? So I think the metrics must change. The types of stories we're telling need to be different. We must not wait for the advocacy of lobby groups to tell these stories. We must be going out and looking for them ourselves. This is the challenge I have not seen addressed yet. I think we're starting to talk about it, absolutely, but I, I don't see any serious, meaningful change. Thankfully, I think those shifts do matter a little. 
But with a shift comes the backlash, which I mentioned. Daily editorial conferences that seek to set the news agenda are setting it in very narrow terms. Emerging journalists are pushing back and the change is not only welcome, but fundamental, I think, to the survival of this profession. So I want to encourage young journalists, and I spoke to the, some of the students before, um, to keep pushing the boundaries. My biggest regret is that I didn't push enough boundaries in the early part of my career. I actually think about it quite a lot. I didn't push those boundaries because I felt so fortunate to even be in those newsrooms because I felt like such an outsider that I didn't know how to rock that boat. And I was fearful of rocking that boat. But I think things are changing and there are more people now and you're not alone. I recall a conversation I had, for instance, with a senior Indigenous contact of mine many years ago that had a really profound impact on me. She said that we were obsessed with the gloom, the dysfunction, but we rarely reported on success, on healthy communities, on strong culture, on language preservation, on country, that we were responsible for perpetuating a one-sided story of failure. So this is our profession's big challenge this year, around a voice to parliament for Indigenous Australians to be enshrined in the constitution, the debate around it. Our job will be having a conversation that involves all of Australia and centres the voices and lives of Indigenous Australians. As journalists, I think this is our biggest and most fundamental challenge. That means seeking to platform a wider range of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander voices and understanding the diversity of experiences and views in Aboriginal Australia. We also have a responsibility to report on this debate with an acute focus on accuracy and fairness. It is our job to provide the facts and allow Australians who all get a vote to make up their own minds. But we also have an obligation to do that without becoming so obsessed with friction and with the hard edges of the debate that we elevate bigotry and conflict for conflict's sake. So this is a huge year and a big test, I think, for our profession. Can we strive for being our best, most robust selves? I think democracy needs us more than ever. Thank you. Wow. There is so much there. I, you know, I've always been in awe of you anyway, um, but that just cements, cements it. Um, we do want to go to questions and there will be people walking around, Steph and um, someone on the other side has, has got the other one. So we, I will go to that. Um, what you said today was completely backed up by new research out from the University of... All that today. today. Um, all of those issues that you were describing in the newsrooms... Um, you know, about retention, about, you know, we can get the kids in the door, but then they don't want to stay. Do you have some solutions, apart, you know, apart from what you've outlined, do you have some solutions for the retention, particularly, of, of young, diverse um, journalists? Because I wonder, is there something that we need to be advocating more from outside of the industry? To support. Oh, I think about this all the time and, uh, you know, young Indigenous reporters at the ABC are often inflicted with my strong um, checking in and also making sure that we don't mess that up. So, yes, we, this isn't new. Like, we, we started, you know, realising you need Aboriginal people in your newsrooms, but, uh, I mean, one of my friends, Charmaine Clark in the 90s was got an ABC cadetship. She was out within a year or something like that. I mean, people, we churned, right? And that's because the workplace was hostile. I think the workplace is still can be hostile. I think it has improved. I don't think we should be doom and gloom. Um, uh, when we have improvements, we should celebrate them because that's the trajectory of progress. So that, that's good. But one of the things we must stop doing is policing people who are different. Mm -hmm. And one of those policings is, and I you know, gave the example of um, uh, journalists of Middle Eastern backgrounds. And uh, you know, this kind of, oh. And, and this, this is not as acute now, but you know, I'm so old, I've covered all the terror raids and you know, that, that whole 
uh, post September 11, I did a lot of reporting on terrorism and uh, radicalization in Australia. That was a lot of the work I did. And I feel like, um, you know, it's, it was a real team Australia, with us or not, or not with us. And I worry about that because these are, these are Australian citizens who are in our newsrooms. Of course, they're with us. They believe in peace and safety. Um, and the idea that they can't be uh, neutral when there's never a question about the neutrality. Mm -hmm. I have never seen anyone question the neutrality of a white man I've worked with, ever. <laughs> yes, that says something, doesn't it? But I've been questioned about my neutrality many times. So I think we need to support them institutionally. I think news organisations need to back them up. I think people like me, who are no longer junior journalists, need to be publicly backing um, our young reporters um, and providing mentorship to them and uh, pushing back on these ideas. Like, for instance, with the voice debate, that's why I ended on it. Um, you know, Aboriginal people have lived experiences of oppression in this country. Like, I just... Just like the same-sex marriage debate, which I have spoken publicly about, it's nothing new about this, um, you know, we, we expected also our gay journalists to have no feelings about this. I mean, this is insane. Yeah. <laughs> this is not real. Uh, and also, it insults our audience. Um, of course, you can do a neutral job of your treatment of something, fairness, robustness. We've got a bunch of principles we teach. It's not hard. It's like, be fair... Ask robust questions of everyone. But that doesn't mean that those reporters don't have lived experiences which are really profound. And if we just expect them to not bring their whole selves to work, then why would they want to stay in that workplace? Uh, it's a question also for us, and this is a little self-indulgent from a journalism education perspective. We struggle to get diverse students to choose to do journalism and I think that's because they do see the abuse that comes with doing the job. Do you have any ideas for us on how we can get more in the door? My colleague um, Tito Ambio who's here always says that the value of a journalism degree and an education is in giving diverse people the skills so they feel that they do they have the skills and they feel comfortable in that newsroom but I've got to get them into my classroom before I can get them into your newsroom. Oh, that's hard. You've just given me a really hard question. Okay. And, but I, I can tackle it. I think um, part of it is what I'm talking about, what we're doing actually on the front line. So that very pithy kind of saying, if you can't see it, you can't be it, it does matter. Um, so when you see it, you think, oh, yeah, that's a realistic... You know, when you see a reporter in a hijab on television, then you might think that you can be a reporter on TV in a hijab. <laughs> like, but it takes the first person to do that. And we've, we've done that. Yeah. So I think when they, when they see evidence that it's happening, you will see people come through. But I think it takes a bit of active recruitment too. And, and that goes, I mean, obviously you take a lot of school leavers. I think it's in the, our schools at our school, even at the school level, anyone will tell you this who's a teacher, and I have a lot of teachers in my life, including my partner, you know, it is the white kids that will put their hands up, right? Yeah. Um, so as a teacher, even, our education system has to get better at actually elevating the voices of people who might not be as bolshy. Yeah. I, I do want to just ask you a bit more about the voice, because I, my name is... Alex Wake, I am woke. I kind of thought that... <laughs> I know. See, I don't think, think I am woke, but let's get into that. But, uh, I but find I... the concept of wokeness <laughs> a joke. Anyway, yes. Um, but I, I just thought that everyone would be voting for The Voice and that I can't even understand why there is a debate. And yet now there is so many different sides to that and, it's, and it is starting to get you know, nasty in some quarters. And I just wonder, how, how, do, we, how do we handle that? We, you know, we're talking about it in our classrooms. How are you handling it on air, bringing in all those different views? Um, well, I've been criticised a lot, so elephant in the room, that I'm not handling it well enough. I absolutely vigorously disagree. Um, I platform all voices actively, uh, enthusiastically, 
Not because I have to, I find them, I'm curious. But journalists should be curious. I'm curious, why, why um, is, for instance, the, some, some progressive Aboriginal people are advocating no? I'm curious about why. <laughs> It's, it's really interesting. Why have they come to that conclusion? That's what journalism should do. I am curious about it. Um, again, I've watched this for a long time. I see the Uluru Statement as a consensus position, so any, any historic, not this year, that's for sure, but historic support I've had for the Uluru Statement, hashtag Uluru Statement, has been because historically it was the consensus view of Aboriginal Australia. It seemed well, this is what the majority of Aboriginal Australians want, and as a non-Aboriginal person who's covered this issue, well, it seems that that's where everyone wants to go. Now, when the rubber hits the road, things change. Referendums are always really contested in our country. Change is hard. Um, there are people with absolutely legitimate issues with the idea. Um, I don't seek to insult them. I actually find the idea that we would just call someone a racist just because they don't like the idea, absurd. I think we should interrogate and be curious about why someone doesn't like the idea. So I, I don't think we should come to it assuming that everyone thinks it's a good idea. But back to facts, which I'm big on. The fact is that the consensus view of Indigenous Australia at a massive convention in the middle of Australia was that this was the right proposal. That is the mainstream view of Aboriginal Australia, but journalists don't just only report the mainstream view, we report all the views, that's our job. So we must absolutely platform the Aboriginal people who are no, the uh, conservatives who don't like messing with the constitution, they just don't, they, they generally don't like messing with the constitution. So how did it get here? Well, the truth is, I think it was always gonna get here. I think uh, a statement that's beautifully written five years ago is different to six years ago to now, actually a proposal, and that's always going to be contested. It's a big change for our country. It's a big change to the business model of this country. Listening to Aboriginal people about policies, very different. If you've studied any history in this country, you will be across. We don't do that. So this is huge change for people, and I think people are entitled to be respected for their views all no campaigners are welcome on my show, um, and I want to hear their views. Some have declined invitations. That's on them. Others haven't. Awesome. I don't want to take all the questions because I've got a room full of curious young people and not so young people who may want to ask some questions. I think there was one over that way first. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, so I had a question about the... Uh, the hierarchical structure of the newsroom. Um, and I just wanted to ask about a bit of a case from, uh, from America, but I promise it's got relevance to Australia. <laughs> so um, in, I think, the last couple of weeks or the last month, um, there are uh, quite a large number of uh, contributors, former and current contributors to the New York Times, who wrote an open letter uh, to the leadership saying, uh, we think uh, you're repeating the mistakes of the 80s in inciting a moral panic. Um, which, you know, in the 80s it was against the gay community and now it's against the trans community. The Times leadership was to say very, you know, uh, kind of in line with what you've been saying, they said, uh, you're activists, uh, not advocates, and you're not welcome and won't be tolerated. That was their words. Um, so when journalists have to work in these hierarchical organisations, how can new journalists challenge those structures and how can senior journalists help them and support them in doing that? Well, I park that particular story because I know I have read about it, but I don't, I don't feel like I'm across enough of the details. To I, I'm actually quite careful about my commentary about things that have an impact, but I can talk about that debate. The trans, the trans debate is happening here too, like here. Um, <laughs> it's absolutely happening. Um, there is a generational divide, which is profound and real. There is a need for our community to have genuine and fair and informed debates about social change and things uh, like, for instance, uh, medical interventions uh, that have an impact on children. 
I believe that is a fair debate to be having. So I am not of the view that we don't have these discussions. I think we do have these discussions. We need to have them rigorous, rigorously, fairly, again, with the facts, not rogue, and we do need to centre people's lived experiences within that. So at the moment, as you know from the story in the UK, anyone's followed it, there has been a big story in relation to uh, puberty blockers, I'm just going to a hole, but puberty blockers being given to children, um, young people in the UK, really big scandal. Um, I believe that is a debate with experts, not uninformed people who just don't like difference, <laughs> with experts that journalism must be, the, must be the space for. I don't think you shut that down. You know why? It's also not in the best interests of trans people. Do you know what trans people tell me? Because I do ask them. <laughs> like, I, I, I know I did this really radical thing. I actually asked trans people about, like, interacting with the medical system. I kid you not. Um, I thought, what should I do? I'll ask some trans people who actually have interacted with the system and find out how they feel. Oh, that's called centering people's actual experience. And what they tell me is they also think our system should be better. We need more investment in medicine. We need more robust structures. You wouldn't know that in the debate though. You would not know that trans people too want more investment in their health. Like seriously, you, you would not actually know it because politicians hijack debates and it becomes about morality and policing of gender, which the gay community has gone through, so we know about it, we're all over it, when actually it should be about health, safety, and it shouldn't be based on judgment. So back to that, um, if, if the cause, and I'm not reflecting on that, is you're not allowed to report on anything, well, I don't agree. I think that you follow the research and the facts. I do, though, think there is an absolute obligation on you as a journalist and as a news organisation to not be inflammatory for the sake of it and to follow rigorously what is a medical and actual identity debate about real people who are living real lives and suffering, can I say, extremely high rates of abuse and distress. So I reckon the trans debate, uh, it, it astonishes me that the voices of trans people who want actual positive change are completely missed as we have these moral panic debates which are all just about dividing us when actually having healthy people living their best full lives is in all of our interests. I wonder about the question on dealing in a hierarchical part of a newsroom. My way of getting around that was trying to find the most powerful person in the newsroom that could help me and advocate for my stories. How do you think young people could navigate bosses that don't want to support stories? Like that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like anything, it's about making... Um, it's about building relationships in any... But that's in any workplace. You build relationships, people trust you. I think there are hierarchies which are natural. Um, I... I also think people should push back against them. Like, and that makes, that's the best, that's any workplace that's a good workplace involves that contest of ideas and, you know, younger generation people pushing back. All of that should happen. But, of course, people who have 20 years' experience are the editors of newspapers or the presenters of radio shows. That, I think, makes sense. I think, you know, you do have to have quite a bit of experience to deal intricately and know a lot of history on issues. Um, so the gatekeepers, I'm not a kind of, you know, kill the gatekeepers, let's get all the kids in. <laughs> Love the kids, but I also had to learn lots of things. There's a lot of things I needed to learn and there were a lot of actually, you know, uh, really nice white men who taught me. <laughs> so uh, there, there needs to be a kind of balancing act there. Good workplaces have a mix of people and experience. And, yeah, you find champions. You find people who will mentor you. I mean, and people, young people are good at that. I have lots of young people who approach me all the time and ask me if I can help them. And I do because I'm like, thanks for calling. I'm flattered. And that's why she's our professor. Um, lady, yes. Hi. Thank you for your lovely presentation. My question is around creating accessible stories. So in an age of 
dwindling literacy levels and social media and commercial news with lots of clickbaity headlines, how do we take these nuanced stories out of our ivory tower and share them with the whole community? For example, my grandmother who left high school you know, in year nine, she reads the Herald Sun and it frustrates me to no end, but that's what she understands and what she can sort of comprehend. So I shouldn't really be blaming her. I then get angry at the paper because it's their responsibility to produce things in a way that she will understand, but that are telling her the truth. Well, you've, you, we are so on the same wavelength. So I'm the least snobby news person you'll ever find. Uh, I really believe in stripping back everything and becoming incredibly uh, conversational and accessible to people. So, I mean, I grew up in a working class community. I, 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 want, I want kids that are growing up in that community, like equivalent communities now, to be able to listen to Radio National and understand what I'm talking about. I don't want them to uh, find it impenetrable because it's um, so highbrow and so inaccessible. So as journalists, I think we need to decode a lot more. I think we need to explain things a lot more. But can I say I think we're already doing that? I, I, don't you reckon? I think that is actually, I talked about some of the things I consider to be more negative, but you're taking me down a different road where I actually think we've had a lot of success. I think we've learnt how to be more relatable. Uh, you know, as, as one of the people I interviewed for, for my piece said, you know, we are in an era of TikTok explainers. We've got journalists now getting on these platforms, explaining complex policy like superannuation taxation, my God, and it makes sense because they're good at explaining things. We're not just here just to hold people to account. We are also an explainers of complex ideas. And I, I see that as a big challenge with the voice, actually, that you raised. Um, and I know, you know, I've got people in my own life who say, I don't actually get what this voice is. Now, some of that is because journalists have maybe failed in making it simple. Like, we can explain it. It's like Aboriginal people, they get elected, then they have some opinions on what to do in their communities. It's like one sentence. <laughs> it's not brain surgery. Wasn't that good at science. Yeah. So, and the Herald Sun um, is, is a good tabloid. Like, it, you might not like all elements of it, but it does it has some really good positive tabloid writing in it. Um, yeah, we should sort of get away from binaries of the highbrow and the lowbrow. Like, there's a lot of good reporting across the media still. I'm finished. Hello. Oh, I can be heard. Uh, PK, thank you for your time tonight. Uh, I'm asking this question from a, a place of considerable ig ignorance, so forgive me. Uh, I'll use the voices as an example of a, a wider issue. Uh, you, you assured us that uh, the voice is supported by the majority of the Aboriginal community, and you also say you welcome people coming to talk to you who have an alternative view. To what extent is it the responsibility of a journalist to weigh those so that the yes side gets more exposure? Rather great than, question. Rather than, I, I guess, the risk is that we'll end up thinking it's a binary. It's 50-50. How do you resolve that? I think... It's a really good question <laughs> um, that, so the ABC has editorial guidance on this. I think really good solid editorial guidance on this about um, uh, involving all elements but giving proportionate weight to them all, right? So if five people protest outside Parliament House against the voice and go crazy, right, five people, um, and we give them the same platform as uh, Megan Davis, who's one of the, I don't know if you all know Professor Megan Davis, excellent woman, um, one of the Uluru Statement um, authors, really, but leaders. I think that's, that's disproportionate, right? Um, I, I think we do need to think about the weight of those things. But there is a, but part of that weight is there is now a, remember this debate, 
sure, Aboriginal people should be centred, but we actually all get a vote. That's how the Constitution works. So Aboriginal people are, what, close to 4% of the population. The rest of us who are non-Aboriginal, and, I'm, and it's a very exclusionary language, I don't usually talk like that. I know mean, there could be some Indigenous Australians in, in the audience, but I think the majority of you would be non-Indigenous, also get a say, right? So um, there's a big, sizable proportion of our parliament right now who are no. How can we not reflect that view? How can we not platform that view? That would be really weird. <laughs> like, that would be strange censorship. That is, that is part of the debate. Um, when I said that the majority of Indigenous Australia supports it, well, there was a constitutional convention and a big process, a democratic process, dialogues across the country in remote places everywhere. It was huge and it culminated in an agreed position. Guess what? Some people walked out on it. Some people didn't like it. Guess what? That's what happens in democracy, right? No one ever expects all white people to agree on things. But as soon as there's any disagreement in Aboriginal Australia, let's smash everything they have to say. <laughs> like, the bar is so much higher for this community. I, I, I do wonder how they get up every day and have debates when white people are allowed to have whatever discussion they want. But it's you know, this massive issue if Aboriginal people disagree. Of course they disagree. They were dispossessed of their land. They all have different ideas about how to get to a sort of place of fairness. Our job is to reflect the views that are happening, to test them and to, you know, not be, not be afraid of doing it. I've had some really robust conversations with people, um, but that doesn't mean they don't deserve a platform. I don't think we should be policing people's voice, though. I think we should be curious and questioning. I love that. There's a question up here. Hi, PK. Thank you for coming and chat to us. Um, my question has some context, but I promise I'm bringing it back. So in 2020, um, American police officer Derek Chauvin murdered uh, George Floyd. And there was a teenager who recorded that with her mobile phone. Um, Danella Frazier, I believe, and she won a, or she was awarded um, a journalism award for that by the Pulitzer Board. Um, so I guess my question is around who gets to tell the stories in a world where so many of us carry a mobile phone in our pockets and can document um, and publicise, what is the, where is the line between journalism and documentation sort of in that context of who gets to tell the stories? That's a really good question too. Oh, nice. You're ah. smart people at this school. <laughs> Jeez, it all happened in the late 90s and it's continued clearly. Um, you know what? That's, that, that's, well, I think it's called citizen journalism, like it's got a name. <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we've democratised journalism, haven't we? We've made it because we have such access to, I mean, my daughter can put together and she's in the audience, hi Luca, she can edit a, a better news uh, s story and than I can, even though I'm trained in this stuff, right? So that's how much we've democratised our access to um, putting stories together, in getting, you know, footage. Anyone can do it. I can interview someone just like this on my phone and it's almost broadcast quality. I have broadcast interviews on Radio National Breakfast that I've just recorded on my phone. Like, that's how good our technology is. That means we should, all of a the sudden, there are, Yes, there are privacy issues as well, but I'm not going to go down a privacy hole. There are eyes and ears everywhere. That footage changed the world, right? No one can tell that story like the footage can. Journalism is about platforming the original, the original experience, but a lot of journalism happened after that, didn't it? About pursuing the justice system, what was going wrong. So you still needed traditional journalism to execute that story later. But in the democratisation and the digitisation of our world, you're able to see this like you never would have. I, I suspect, I say this with a lot of confidence, that a lot of black people have died at the hands of white police. And I suspect we will never see any of that footage over many years. But now we sometimes do. And I think it has the capacity to really change the world. There's another one. Uh, there's one at the back. I can see your hand up there. Oh, sorry, this one. 
I get in trouble. I'm making Steph run up those stairs. Luckily, she's a bit healthy. Hello. Um, first of all, thank you for your amazing presentation. Um, my question relates to cancel culture that you addressed previously. Um, I entirely agree that it's more corrosive in terms of allowing the wider community to learn. Um, however, I am becoming increasingly tired of hearing, um, it seems to be generally extremist neo-libs or right wing saying things that are entirely incorrect and untrue um, and calling it freedom of speech. So at what point is policing and silencing opinion um, necessary? Again, another really good <laughs> question. Um, look, I, I'm not into deplatforming as a concept because I think, um, you know, the cliche that I put in my um, speech, I really believe that disinfectant is, you know, like sunlight is the best disinfectant. You need, to, if you've got like extreme views, pretending that they don't exist actually doesn't make them go away. <laughs> um, people knowing that they exist, being aware of them, um, questioning where they're coming from, that at least puts us on a path where we know what's going on and we need to know what's going on in our culture or we go into bubble land, which I'm really angry about when people say, oh, well, um, it's my thing at the moment, Alex. I like living in my bubble. And I'm like, oh my God, we live in a country. Look, just, you can't just, no, 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 no. We have to understand other people's experience. Like how are people who are living in coal, coal communities feeling, you know, where their jobs rely on coal? Like it might be easy in the city of Melbourne to be against coal, but if your job relies on coal, you probably have some feelings about it, right? So I'm not saying then you keep coal. What I'm saying is that silencing isn't going to fix that 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 disgruntled view. Um, you asked me where the line is. There's always a line. Unlimited free speech. We live in a society. We have our our rights curtailed all the time. Right? Every day our rights are being curtailed, but I think in a good way because we're living in a society. I can't do whatever I want whenever I feel like. Um, I think when we incite violence, I think that's pretty serious. I don't think journalists should platform the inciting of violence. Um, and I think that we, we need to be really careful if we are going to put someone to air or interview them about the way that we, the context around the story, if we're going to put them to air, all of the other stuff, the, all of the ex explanation of what you're doing. So I do think there are some limits, but broadly, I'm actually very in favour of um, people having a right to speak. And I hate the term cancel culture because it has been, it, it it's implies something else, something like, you know, when women raise, for instance, that, and I'm not going to get into this sticky fingers debate, <laughs> I know, but when women say they don't feel safe, I don't think anyone's being cancelled. I think they're telling us they don't feel safe. <laughs> like, I just think they're telling us, and, and so I don't really subscribe to that being cancel culture. I think sometimes we need to be a bit smarter about, you know, the things that we're actually objecting to and voices that have a right to be heard, even if we don't don't agree with them. And there are many things I don't agree with, but that doesn't mean I don't think I should hear it. I think one of the things you do really well is when someone does tell a mistruth on your program, you're the first to call it out. And you you have a really good way of sort of saying, no, I know that's that's not right. And I think because of your you know years of experience, breadth of research, just general knowledge, you can actually do that. And I just want to call out to our ABC RMIT fact check unit and our fact check class in particular that all our journalism students must do, you know, making sure you know what you're talking about when you go to do an interview so someone can't actually tell you something that's wrong. Well, you've, you've got the facts and figures there. You don't need to miss, to repeat, um, you know, something that's factually wrong. You can call it out and you do that beautifully for anyone. I'm sure most of you are listening to PK in the morning. There's one last question up the back. Oh, 
Sorry? Yes, yeah, sorry, this one. Uh, I, I respect the same quality about you, and I think my question is coming up from that perspective, that you stand up and you voice out something that you're not comfortable with if, if a guest is saying something. Um, and I've learned over the years that when you want to stand up for something, it's not easy, right? It, it takes a lot of pushback and what thought. So I think it's something that I'm uh, trying to learn. And so I wanted to ask you, uh, what has been your biggest challenge in trying to be inclusive in your reporting of stories? And how did you navigate through that? Because you've probably worked really hard as well. It didn't happen overnight. Um, so. In trying to be inclusive? In, in reporting your stories. Um, I think my show tries to do it quite a lot on air. That's, and, and it hasn't so much been our biggest challenge, it's just been our biggest mission, which is um, being inclusive is about really being thoughtful about who you're putting to air. So, you know, you used to only, I'll give you an example. I've got a good one from today, actually. You used to only hear economics talked about by men, yeah? like. That's, but you know there's heaps of women economists who know, like understand economics. You might like to invite them onto the program, for instance. Like that's the kind of living your practice. No, that doesn't mean you don't, there's some great men. I have a, in fact, listen to the party room today. We have Ian Verinder on, a lovely white man who's very smart and knows a lot about the economy and I grill him about the economy. I love talking about the economy, it's my favorite topic. But um, he's not the only voice. Uh, now. As in terms of inclusion, one of the things we used to find, and it's an interesting anecdote you'll find interesting, when we used to approach women, things are changing a bit, women are, but they would often decline our interviews, even though they were the most skilled person, because they had to, and this is exactly what Sam Mostyn spoke about today at the press club, they had to pick up their kids from school, so they couldn't do that interview at that time, because mm -hmm. they were doing that. Um, or they weren't. They would. They would talk about how someone was more qualified than them. Again, that comes from privilege. I have never ever heard any man say that to me ever. <laughs> that someone's more qualified than them to talk. But I've heard many women say that to me. So part of the inclusion, and it's not just accepting that. I have said to people, "Oh no, we came to you because you're the most. That's why we came to you." Or my producer has said, "Oh." Bring your daughter in. Um, my executive producer, acting executive producer, Jade Clark, does this, where she's like, "I'll bring, I'll bring your kid in. I'll just, I'll look after her while you're on air." There's things you can do <laughs> to ensure that you elevate these people because they're actually really interesting, and we want to hear from them. Um, but you actually have to be active in doing that. Um, but also, my advice, though, um, to in terms of my own work, is to women, to people you know, in any minority group or anyone who feels like they're not the most, not the most qualified is, you know what, just do it anyway. I have never, ever said no to any request, even when I've thought, do I know enough? And you know why? Not only because I want every opportunity, but I go, like all girls do, and I study up. So if I'm invited, I don't say, oh, I'm not smart enough, I don't know about that. I just go away and I ensure by the time I meet that obligation or deadline that I know whatever I've been asked to do. And that is my advice to you to keep doing that, to, to not second guess yourself and to keep pushing through because as soon as we start self-excluding, then the same voices will continually dominate. I think that is an absolutely beautiful place to end it because I think, um, and if Naya and Abdul could um, come come up, um, you have shown today how thoughtful, how well researched you were. You were clearly the best person for us to make an honorary professor. So could everyone please join me in saying thank you so much to PK? Thank you. And can I say, I do want to say, I thought. Ooh, half an hour lecture, Thursday night, how boring, are people going to find it boring? And you were all so attentive, so thank you for being such a great audience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Oh, thank you.
slightly bigger than you. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Alex. Is that all right? Always. Um, are you right? Yeah, I'm fine. Carry on what? <laughs>